Good evening and welcome to the JFK Junior Forum. My name is Mark Guerin and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics and we warmly welcome you for a very interesting conversation this evening entitled Rebuilding Community, How We Go From I to We. And we're very fortunate to welcome back to the Institute of Politics, uh, Professor Robert Putnam and Shailen Ramey Garrett, his co-author of an important new book entitled The Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again. And in their book, they look at the important issues in our civic life today of division, of inequality, of social dislocation, and draw from history on how we might use the historical trends of political, social, and cultural norms to perhaps lead to going from I to we in our civic life. So we are thrilled to welcome back uh, Professor Robert Putnam, of course, who's the Peter and Isabel Malkin Professor, Research Professor of Public Policy at the Kennedy School and FAS, um, Emeritus, the author of numerous books, including The Celebrated Bowling Alone and his scholarship on the politics and, and cultural issues. His co-author, we welcome back to the Institute of Politics, uh, Shailen Romney Garrett, who is uh, also the co-author of the book entitled How Religion Divides and Unites Us. And uh, she knows us well. She was a return Peace Corps volunteer in Jordan and brought her important service as a Peace Corps volunteer to found a nonprofit called Think Unlimited that works to catalyze social innovation uh, in the Middle East. So we're fortunate we welcome them both back to the Institute of Politics. We've also asked a good friend of the Institute of Politics, Jonathan Capehart, to moderate tonight's discussion. Of course, we know Jonathan's work and feel it's a prize winning work for the Washington Post columns and editorial work and his um, MSNBC, MSNBC Sunday show uh, with Jonathan Capehart, who combines his keen observations of politics and cultural and political trends to moderate tonight's very interesting discussion. So with my thanks to Professor Putnam and Shaylin, and of course to Jonathan for moderating uh, tonight's conversation. I'll turn it over to you, Jonathan, with our gratitude. Mark, thank you very much um, for that introduction and for the invitation to moderate this session with uh, Professor Putnam and Ms. Romney Garrett. But, um, and I'm going to start with you, Shaylin, if I can call you Shaylin. And Professor Putnam, can I call you Bob? Yeah, please do. Okay, great. So, Shaylin, I want to start with I want to start with you and basically have you to ping pong briefly because your um, your thesis is basically over the last 125 years we've gone. It can be characterized as a as an I we I trend. So let's start with the first I. What is the I? What characterize what characterize the I? that made up America at the beginning of that period? Sure. So what we're really looking at is the early 20th century, even maybe a decade or two before the 20th century began, which is a time that, of course, Mark Twain disparagingly called the Gilded Age. And um, in this book, we're looking at this period of 125 years through a few different lenses. The first is economics. The second is politics. Then we look at the social fabric or society, and we also look at culture. So when we're looking at the Gilded Age, um, what are some of the characteristics of that I ethos that characterized that time? Well, from an economic standpoint, there were, well, first of all, I guess the background is that there was unprecedented prosperity, unprecedented educational opportunity, and unprecedented personal freedom. I mean, those were some of the positive aspects of this period. But in economics, there was extreme income inequality and class segregation. You had corporate monopolies dominating the economy. You had workers powerless to negotiate. Um, pollution choking the air and waterways. You had contaminated products getting into the, into, the, um, into the marketplace. So it was really a sort of profit at all costs mentality. In politics, there was a relentless zero sum power struggle in the public square, repeated failure, failure to compromise, extremely polarized environment. Um, third parties were becoming a, a really popular option as people thought that the two party system had sort of failed. Populism and socialism had surged and, and there was a lot of cynicism about a rigged system. Um, we had a very dislocated social fabric. It was very isolated and lonely, disillusionment and despair, nativism, suspicion of immigrants. 
And in culture, we had sort of an extreme self-reliance. Um, we had uh, crime and moral decay, widespread drug and alcohol use, um, uh, extreme consumerism and materialism, as well as sort of a, a nostalgia for an earlier era. So in many ways, the feeling at the time was that America had gone off the rails. Everyone was sort of turning inward as a way to, to cope with this. Um, and, and it was a period not just sort of from these historical characteristics, but actually from measurable statistical data, we can point mm -hmm. to this being one of the most I periods in American history. And what's interesting about what everything that you described, if someone had come into the middle of your answer, they would think you were talking about right now, yeah. the time that you are that that we are in right now. And instead, as you said, you're talking about sort of the few decades before the turn from the 19th to the 20th century. Um, when, Bob, does the we part of this continuum start? It starts in this, you know, it's, we now know, of course, what happened, but at the time it would have been a shock because everybody was feeling, just as we are now in America, feeling unbelievably bad. I mean, just everything seems to be wrong. The only thing we agree on is that everything's going wrong in America today. That's the way it felt then. And yet, Within five or ten years, it was a long process. We pivoted, the country pivoted. We didn't become we overnight, of course not. Right. But we pivoted and began moving in a more we direction. And what does that mean statistically? It means our the distribution of income gradually began to, to narrow. That is the, the degree of inequality in America from about 1910 till a, a goes for this continues until about 1970 we were steadily becoming more equal. The gap between rich and poor was narrowing during that period. Didn't go to zero, of course, because we, we, you know, we still had differences, but the trend was very strongly and up, upward toward more equality for about 50 to 60 years. In the sphere of politics that Shailen talked about, the same thing exactly is true. There's a turning point, roughly speaking, around 1910, and Americans gradually become more cooperative and more tolerant across party lines. And that trend also continues for the next 60 years. So that um, by, the, by the 1960s, by the 1960s, 1950s, there is, you know, a lot of overlap between, between Republicans and Democrats. Most of the New Deal was supported by a majority of Republicans. Most of the, most of the great society was supported by a, a majority of Republicans. And most of or at least much of Reagan's revolution in 1980 was supported by a lot of Democrats. There was, and now think what's happening in Congress today. That's just completely not true. 100% of Republicans are voting one way and, and, and we're now back now to the way we were um, 125 years ago. Um, I'm conscious of the time. And so I wanna just say very quickly, the same trend is true in terms of our connections with one another, in terms of what I used to call social capital. That is the degree to which we, join things. We had been very isolated in the Gilded Age. We began pretty quickly to, to join things. Our family life became more, more intense and more frequent. Again, that, and for the next 50 years, 60 years, we went, we were moving toward a more I society, social trust, people trusting other people went up and all of those trends began to, well, we didn't know they were peaking, but in the middle sixties, basically we were at the apex, what proved to be the apex mm -hmm. of a 60-year of a trend toward a more we society. And so then, and I want each of you to touch on this. So then what was it? What happened that took us from this apex, this we, to where we are now, where we are, um, from your, your thesis, back to an I age? Right. Shailen, you, you, you start. Well, you know, we often get the question, so, so this is a, a story, the I, we, I story is a story that's based on scores of different data points and different mm -hmm. sets, data sets, right? And so we're looking at a ton of different variables here that fall into these different four different buckets that we've identified, economics, politics, society, and culture. So people often say, well, which of them turned first? If we knew which one turned first in the upswing, we'd know to focus on that today. And if we knew which one turned first in the downturn, then we would know what caused all the problems, right? And um, a lot of people assume that actually it was the economic variables that turned first. 
which actually turns out not to be the case. Um, it's really difficult, and Bob is the one to speak better about this in terms of the statistical background, but it's really hard to identify leads and lags with so many different variables turning roughly at the same time. Um, we often like to describe it as if you're watching a flock of birds in flight, all of a sudden the entire flock switches in the, and goes in the other direction, and you're looking at it trying to go, which one turned first, right? <laughs> it's very difficult to tell, and the same turns out to be true in, in terms of these statistical measures. A great but analogy. Thing, yeah, but one thing we do know is actually it was not economics, which I think is very surprising to people because a lot of times we tend, you know, particularly in the social sciences, we tend to have this view that it's a sort of vaguely Marxist idea about history that economics drives everything, right? Mm -hmm. That turns out not to be the case in this story. So that's one thing that we know sort of was not one of the culprits. Bob. I, um, well, I want to uh, say two things um, quickly here, John. First of all, I'm the only person in this room who actually knows the 60s. I was there. <laughs> I was. I graduated from college in 1963. Graduated from high school in 1959, and and was right in the thick of it. Um, and um, so I'm not going to take any guff from anybody. Any of you young people who can tell us what happened in the 60s? I was there. Um, the fact of the matter is a lot of things happened at the same time. Mm -hmm. It was not one crisis. It was a dozen different crises that all came at the same time. And this is not a very um, persuasive, uh, not a very satisfying explanation, but I think American society, we went into the 60s, moving in a we direction, ever steadily we direction, and we came out of the 60s in a I direction, moving, I mean, not instantly I, but moving in the other direction. And I think that changed you know, if you ask different people what caused it, some people say it was the assassinations. I mean, that was the, of, 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 of John Kennedy and, and Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy and so on. Some people say it was the pill, which led to different um, sexual uh, norms. Um, some people say it was the oil crisis, which led to an economic collapse somewhat later. Some people say it was Vietnam. A lot of people say it's Vietnam, although mm -hmm. Vietnam actually didn't have a whole lot to do with either the oil crisis or the or the pill. What I'm trying to say is, and there were many other things that happened. Um, so it's not easy to to pinpoint any right. one. But and this is the most important thing I think about the book, and you know this, but I, we need to underline this. It would have been many people when they look at these curves, they say, "Well, what happened up there? What happened at the top that caused the change?" We think that's the less interesting correct uh, question to ask. We think it's less interesting because that leads inevitably to a, a way of thinking that is nostalgic. We figure out what, and not unlike what our the past most recent president talked about, he wanted to go back to the, you know, the great time in the 50s and 60s. That's not what we want to do. And, that, and we wrote this book before he was right where he is now. Um, we think the more interesting question is not what this curve looked like when we ended up there, but how did it start? That is, because that's where we are now. We are now in a period in which we want to, we want to turn us, turn the society in a more we direction, directionally, we want to go that. And that's what the folks in the progressive era did. And we could, we could talk a lot about what lessons we can learn from the progressive era, but that's, that's why we want to, I, I'm, of course, we'd, I'd love to talk about the 60s all night, but that's why we want to focus, focus on the, the earlier pivot point. Does that make sense, Jonathan? Yeah, well, I have, I, so in terms of the data, I have to tell you, as I was re reading along and I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, okay, you know, as a black man, I'm reading this in this we, 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 yep. and I'm thinking, am I part, wait, are black people part of this we? Because I seem to recall, even though I wasn't there, that things were not going so great for African-Americans in that early time, certainly in the I period, but also in the we period. But the thing that you write about, you both write about that I found really surprising is that even in those fraught times of segregation and Jim Crow and on the upswing, as you call it, African-Americans were also part of the upswing in the data. And so I guess in talking about that, answer this question for me. How much did segregation play in the ability of African-Americans to improve um, by, the, by, by the data in those, in those four buckets? Well, we can either, both of us can talk about this because we 
we're both very interested. Shailen, why don't you you uh, go because you you know the story very well, and you can tell it not just from, I can tell it from a data point of view, but you can tell it from the history point of view. Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting about this, I mean, it, it is undeniable. You know, when we look at the very beginning of this period, um, the 19 as the 19th century ended and the 20th century began, you know, the outlook for African Americans was incredibly bleak. We know that there had been some um, significant improvement right in the wake of, of Reconstruction that was then summarily reversed um, with the Southern, you know, pro um, project of reclaiming white hegemony called um, redemption. redemption. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, we'd seen some progress and it had been ripped away. And so this was a really dark period, right? And and not only that, you know, these progressives that we sort of laud, and we haven't talked too much about their story, but I'm sure we'll get there. But these progressives who, who sort of were integral in this upswing, many of them were racist. Um, many of them were, they just did not have the circle of moral concern that sort of extended fully to people of color. So those are things that are undeniable. Um, at the same time, we sort of have this view of that period of history, that first two thirds of the 20th century, as this moment where nothing really changed for Black Americans. There was no progress, right? Like if we track these inverted U curves, as we call them, sort of from I to we, things were getting better and better over the course of the 20th century. And then you say, well, what did that look like for racial equality? Well, the, you'd sort of assume that, that it would look something like a hockey stick, right? If you had a graph, that it would be flat, no progress. And then all of a sudden, when we have the civil rights revolution, things sort of immediately get better. And uh, when we looked at the data, we saw some surprises. First things, you know, there are a lot of things that aren't surprising. In many cases, that hockey stick story, so to speak, it was true, especially when it comes to um, Black political representation. Not yeah. a lot of change until the civil rights movement. Uh, <clears throat> white supremacy in mainstream culture and media. Uh, uh, lack of access to professional schools and jobs. Residential segregation. I mean, those are things that very much fit that kind of archetypal story that we have about racial progress in America. But when you look at material equality, and by that we're talking about things like life expectancy, infant mortality rates, um, relative income, home ownership. I mean, things that are really important, right? Um, even political participation, uh, voter registration and voter participation. You actually see a slow but unmistakable progress toward parity between black and white Americans. Now, granted, it was too slow. It didn't come anywhere near to full equality. But what's surprising is that the bulk of the progress that took place in the 20th century took place in that first two thirds of the century, which is like completely mind blowing, right? Because we have this idea that all of the progress took place in the wake of the civil rights movement. When in fact, in the wake of the civil rights movement, what we had is what we call in the book, a foot off the gas period. We had this move toward progress during the sort of roughly 1940 to 1970 period. And then after the civil rights movement, we have stagnation and even reversal on these very critical measures. So, that is, a, that is a puzzling story. How is it that Black Americans were making this great progress during that first two thirds of the century? And then in the moment when we would have expected that progress to accelerate, it actually stagnates. It's, it's worthwhile, uh, Jonathan, uh, you have one, one of the other questions, but it's worthwhile asking, how did that happen? Yeah. How did both halves of that happen? How did it happen that Blacks were making a whole lot more, pro not just making progress equal to everybody else, equal to whites, but making faster progress? Mm -hmm. on economics and education and health and so on. And then how come it all stopped? Well, that was the question. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I'm going to, I'm going to try to yeah. answer. Well, I mean, my, so my, my question though, the second part of my question was just sort of dealing with my, the, my, the fascination that I had. And that was how much of a role did segregation play yeah. in, that, in that steady progression that Shaylin was just talking about? Yeah, I, yeah. right. I, I don't, I don't want to say that segregation um, enabled that somehow. I don't want to say that segregation right. was a favorable thing, but segregation was a concomitant. Because, and this is a story, most Black folks in America know this story that I'm about to say very quickly, but almost no white folks know this story. And it is that the most important thing that happened in the first two thirds of the 10th century to blacks is the great migration. The massive movement of large millions and millions and millions of black people, essentially from the rural South, where they were still living in peonage, to 
the south side of Chicago or to, you know, Boston or to Milwaukee or to Oakland. And it was not perfect. In, it, I mean, there was a lot of discrimination and so on in the south side. Let's take the south side of Chicago. A lot of discrimination there. But it wasn't as bad as it had been in rural Mississippi. And that, and since such a hard, large fraction of Blacks made that journey with their own feet, they were voting to move to more equality. And it showed up. The schools and the hospitals and so on in Chicago of Black folks were worse than the schools and, 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 and hospitals available to white folks in Chicago, but they were a heck of a lot better than the schools and hospitals, mainly no schools and no hospitals available to people right. themselves. So, and they were segregated in the North. Uh, and that, that's the sense, that's the point you're making that it's, it was, the South Side of Chicago was very segregated. And I'm, I'm not trying to defend that, but I am saying, and I don't think it was a cause of this, but, or even a necessary concomitant of it, but it was true at that period in other words, I don't want to say segregation liberated well, blacks. No, no, no. Well, here's here's why here's why the question popped into my head, and particularly when it comes to say uh, education, sure. that there are a lot, and I'll just I'll just speak for myself. I'm not speaking for the race. But I, there are a <laughs> lot of African Americans who who some will say, you know, when we had all black schools with black teachers teaching black children the education was better. And so that's when I was reading along and I should point out that in your chapter, you have in your book, you have an entire chapter dedicated to this. So folks who are watching, you know, the kind of, the question that I ask is almost a little unfair because it requires a whole lot more time to really discuss than we actually have. But I do, it, it, it just sort of hit me as, as fascinating. Yeah where we were. But now, so here's the thing. We've got this upswing. All of these things are, are, are happening. And I understand that, you know, there isn't, you know, one thing that has the we start falling into, into I. But you don't shy away from the role that um, white backlash played in us descending from, from we to I. And really, isn't it part of the cycle that we've seen reconciliation then gives way to redemption and a backlash and redemption. And then the slow slog through the upswing. And then, you know, that hockey stick of civil rights advancements for African-Americans. And then, as you say, in the latter part of the sixties into the seventies comes the downs, comes the slide. Right. So, um, so go ahead, Bob. No, no, it's a very important question. I, one thing I just need to say very quickly sure. uh, to your viewers, you'll know this. This book was written and sent to the publishers a year ago now, before the virus, before the economic collapse, and most importantly, before uh, BLM, before the Black Lives Matter movement. And so all of that, we think actually fits our story very well, but it, we didn't know about, we didn't know right. it was going to happen. And and well, Shayla, you, 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 it's your part of the story. So go ahead and explain the, uh, the connection between the BLM and, 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 the, and our story, the story we tell. Yeah. I mean, I think you bring up so many interesting points. I mean, I think that, you know, a, a lot of the way that we just, just going back briefly to what you were saying sure. before, Jonathan, a lot of what we write about um, in terms of the, the, the what happened with black americans during that we period was that black americans were really standing up to claim their place within the american we they were doing this important thing that was citizenship oriented which is reclaiming agency right building their own businesses their own schools their own civic societies they participated hugely in this american civic boom just sort of in their own sphere right and and so that's really important um but i also think um there's so many different, like, as you say, there's so much to, to cover here. I'm not sure what well, I want to focus on, but, but I do want to say that um, with regard to the question of white backlash, you had, you know, I think what we, what we want to communicate is that to a certain extent, the fact that many of these progressives who sort of engineered the upswing were themselves racist in a sense widening that we to include people of color got sort of kicked down the road, which we've seen, as you say, many, many times in American history, where it's like, we can make progress so long as like, we don't have to deal with the race issue. Do you know what I mean? And we sort yeah. of sacrifice the needs of people of color on the altar of progress, in a sense. And the fact that that the progressives did that, 
meant that the upswing had sort of knit into it the seeds of its own demise. Does that make sense? Yes. So in a way, this multi-decade um, movement toward I facilitated this fragile national consensus, which in the 1960s allowed us to pass civil rights legislation and start to widen that we. But the fact that we hadn't done the work underneath that of real racial reconciliation meant that the minute that those laws were in place, white Americans started to say, not in my backyard. Like, I agree with this in principle. And the, the survey data fascinatingly show this quite clearly. Everybody was you know, in support of the civil rights legislation. And then the minute that it was passed, they started thinking, oh, the Johnson administration started moving too quickly and implementing integration, these sorts of things. So that's that white backlash that we're talking about, which then becomes a part of this unraveling of the we. Now, did America make a broader turn toward I um, and that was what triggered the white backlash, or did the white backlash trigger a broader turn toward I? That's really hard to say, but the two definitely happened um, together. And that's mm -hmm. a hugely important part of this story. Right. And I think just the last point that I'll make is when we see the Black Lives Matter movement today, what is being called for is A, recognizing the way in which structural inequality and structural racism was knit into those programs that were built during the upswing that we now need to face, and B, being called, America being called upon to finally do the work of racial reconciliation, the heart work of racial reconciliation that never got done before. And I want to make sure, Shailene, did you say the hard work or the heart work? Both. I said heart work <laughs> as in great. heart, but the heart work is the harder yeah. work, right? right? And that's why we never do it. We think right. we can do the work with policies and politics and programs. We never stop and say, when are we actually going to come into community with one another fully? And that requires some serious hard work. I love the way you put that, Bob. I, I just want to, I, I know we want to involve other section questions, but I want to say two things quickly about um, George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement um, last summer. First of all, to the black folks who were taking part, especially the young black folks, they knew that there had been stagnation on the part of uh, black white equality for 50 or 60 years, for 50 or 60 years after the civil rights movement, they knew the facts that we've described that white folks didn't. So white folks, you know, lots of white folks said, what do these people want? I mean, for goodness sakes, we've had the civil rights and it was over, you know, we did that 50 years ago, we don't need to go back there. But black folks know that we hadn't made a single movement toward greater equality in that post-civil rights movement. Secondly, and this is why I, I think there's a little bit of hope. Many of the people, at least at the outset, were young white people in, a, in, in taking part in those marches. I recognize this is complex, but it was certainly more than was true of the equivalent period in the 60s. I know because that was the period I was around. And there were some whites, of course, who were involved in the black in the civil rights, the first civil rights movement. But they weren't, they didn't represent the full views of, of, of that, of the generation of young white people then. But now we know what the data look like. Young white people are into the, are on the same side as a, a black, a black uh, people who are protest, protesting inequality. I don't want to be, I don't want to be Pollyannish about this, but I do think there's a chance that this is not yet one more time through this cycle of what you described from you know Reconstruction to redemption. Right. Oh, that's all I want to say. So, then, so, so, Bob. Um, so now we're back into now we're in the present day I period. Yes. And as you you pointed out, you and Shaylin wrote this book, handed it in before the pandemic, before b before the election, everything. And yet the book comes out and everything that we're going through right now, as, you, as you've already said, fits right in to, to what you're saying. So given where we are right now, do you think, are we at the end of the beginning of a new upswing? Or are we still sliding, sliding our way down through I, trying to make our way back up to we? Well, that's a great question. Of course, that's in some sense, that's the $64,000 question here. And um, I, I wanna, and well, I'm sure both Shailen and I will wanna say something about it. I wanna begin the frame and then Shailen, you jump in by saying, what lessons can we learn from the last time, Jonathan? This is, this is relevant. And um, one of the things, one of the most basic lessons we learned from the last time, uh, there are a lot, but one of the most basic lessons is 
what sometimes people in jargon call agency. But what that meant was the people in, in 1910, they were young people. They were mostly young folks, the people, the progressives of that era. We haven't talked much about them, but they're discussed in the book at great length. They were mostly young people. They were mostly working at grassroots. They were mostly organizing the grassroots. And, and they were very morally, morally aware. It was not just a, it was a deep moral conviction that they had that they ought to move in the right direction. And they knew they faced a choice. They could continue to drift and things could just get worse and worse. Or they could try to step into the flow and, and change the direction in which we were headed. And the less, this, is, this is what the data show. This is not a, it's a little bit of a sermon, I admit, but it's not just a sermon. The data show people could change the direction of their country, especially if they work together. And therefore, now what, back to our question, the question about today. I think that there are some encouraging signs. There are some discouraging signs about where we are now with respect. Now, I don't mean, I'm not talking about the short run, the next six months. I'm talking about the, are we in a historical period where we can move in the right direction? And there are a lot of things we can both talk about, favorable signs and unfavorable signs. But the most important thing to recognize, and especially young Americans today have to recognize, is it's up to you. Mm -hmm. That is, you were the ones, in fact, you didn't cause this. I'm talking to my grandchildren. You didn't cause this. You're the victims of all this. But don't get cynical because people just like you facing exactly these problems 125 years ago with the same kind of constraints, they together turned the country around. I'm sorry, I get off my stool here a little bit. Uh, but I'm, <laughs> that's, what I, that's why I'm a, I don't know quite because I don't know. I'm very hopeful, very hopeful about this younger generation. But that's what it turns on. Mm -hmm. Shaylin, are you as, are, are you as optimistic? I'm optimistic mostly because the biggest lesson and the biggest message of this book is we have been in a situation breathtakingly similar to the one that we are in today. And we turn it around, right? And so if we've done it once before, why can't we do it again? And so I'm optimistic in that sense. But I think Bob's absolutely right that that's a question of critical mass. How many people are going to get on board with this idea that we need to right the ship? Now, I will say this to the question of how far into the upswing are we or are we into the upswing yet or not? You have to keep in mind that this book, you know, when we talk about the beginning of the upswing, the very beginning, what we were talking about was a pivot. Think about what a pivot means. It actually means that you're standing in the same place, but before you were facing one direction and now you're facing another direction, right? So you actually haven't moved yet. So the circumstances themselves haven't changed, but you have oriented yourself and your energy in a different direction. And so there are still going to be all these countervailing forces pushing against that new direction. Does that make sense? And so I think what we're really looking for is a critical mass of people pivoting toward a different set of values in America. We're not going to feel like, oh, well, all of a sudden we're in upswing, like tomorrow. But are we going to feel that there's a, there's a growing sense of community and a growing sense of solidarity around pivoting and being willing to talk about that pivot in the moral terms that it deserves. Right. So, so then, get, then, given the definition of pivot, um, because there's a great, a great visual, pivots happen, you haven't moved, you've just changed your direction. So is it too soon to say that 2020 is that pivot moment, given that we were in a presidential, a, a, pre, a consequential presidential election, Given that the George Floyd was killed on May uh, May thirtieth or May twenty fifth, right, it was Memorial Day, smack in the, almost smack in the middle of twenty twenty. To my mind, given your your description, your definition, Shaylin, if that's not a pivot, I don't know what is, or is it too soon? Well. I'm sorry. We both want to jump in. I, I, I <laughs> so jump much in. to say here. You go, and then <laughs> Shaylin will get the last word before we go to Q and A from the students. Um, I think we can say a little bit about what what it would look like if we were making if if we had pivoted and we were sort of moving in that direction. So let me give a couple of things it would look like. You'd look because young people were so important the last time. They were the ones who led this movement before. You'd look to see, well, how about young people now? Are they likely to be moving in this? Are they likely to not have, what have they done, but have they turned and become much more involved in trying to direct the country than they were 10 or 15 or 20 years ago? My, 
my answer to that question is absolutely yes. Greta Thunberg and the kids from uh, Dorothy Parkland. Yeah. Mar and Marjorie Stoneman so those, those those kids are doing exact exactly what I'd want them to do if we were if the role if the pivot had begun mm -hmm. or, or take uh, the fact that it's uh, that the we, another one of the lessons from the previous time that we talked about is that it began at the grassroots did not begin in Washington did not begin with political leaders it began with the grassroots so I'd be asking myself well are there signs now across the country in small towns in the middle of America, not just in, you know, in DC or in New York or Boston or whatever, but in ordinary places across America, are there signs that ordinary people across party lines are getting together and trying to fix the problems there? Because that's where it began the last time. Well, to some extent, I think there is evidence that that's happening. And that is the kind of thing that makes me optimistic. The last point I'll make, and because I know Shailen would want to make this point too, we think that the, that the earliest sign, the last time we went through, is that people began taking moral questions seriously and asking difficult questions, moral questions about themselves. Am I doing what I ought to do? I mean, morally, what I ought to do. And, you know, we've lived a long time over the last 20 or 30 years with people doing lots of things, but not all that many people asking themselves harsh questions about what am I devoting my life to? That's what it'll look like. And you know there are there are signs of that beginning to happen in some religious communities in America. I'm uh, Shaila, I've forgotten the name of the of the of the black preacher. Uh, uh, the Reverend William Barber, who's yes, leading Barber, moral yeah. marches on Washington, right? That's and exactly what it'll look like. And that's it, not. I'm not talking about race, Jonathan. I'm talking about a person of faith saying, "Look, think about what our moral obligations to one." Mm -hmm. and, and there's hey. there's moral indignation directed outward. And there's moral indignation directed inward. And Richard Hofstetter, the, the famous historian, wrote about the progressive era that it was there was a movement built by people who had moral indignation directed inward. It's one thing to look around and say, oh, we need to just rid society of all these bad apples and then we'll be fine. It's another thing to say, wait a minute, what role am I playing in having created this multifaceted crisis? And so to, to your question specifically about 2020, I would say, you know, Bob spoke about the 60s as like a multifaceted crisis, a nervous breakdown in America. I think you could argue something similar about the sort of the Industrial Revolution and that precipitated the Gilded Age. So I think to me, 2020 is the multifaceted <laughs> crisis. Okay. The question is, are we going to respond to that question by turning outward, which is what the progressives did, the capital P progressives? of 125 years ago? Or are we gonna to respond to the crises by turning inward, which is largely what Americans did during the 1960s? If we're gonna keep turning inward, we're gonna keep going down this ever darkening path. The other thing um, is just that, I, so so I think it's, it's, I don't think that the George Floyd itself is a pivot. George Floyd is a crisis. Right. Whether we pivot or not has to do with how we respond to that. And that has to do with how we use our agency and our moral agency and our citizenship agency. And it's going to be a question of critical mass. I think people who are looking at 2020 going, oh, when is that going to be over? When can we just go back to normal? Those are going to be the people pulling in, in the wrong direction. The people saying, this is a moment that we've been given the opportunity to question things that weren't working to bring things to the surface that we weren't willing to talk about before, let's work with that and move in a better direction. That's what's gonna push us toward the upswing. And with that, we are going to go to questions. We have AJ from Harvard College, AJ. Hi, thank you all so much for being here and for such an engaging discussion thus far. Um, my name is AJ, uh, I'm calling Hi, Oh, no worries. Uh, I'm calling in from St. John's, Florida. Um, and my question today has to do with something um, that was discussed a bit earlier. Um, and it's the idea that during the sort of progressive area, there was actually a lot that um, the Democratic uh, Party and the Republican Party had in common, at least on many issues that mattered, um, especially those relevant to pulling the country out of the Great Depression and the attendant economic crisis. Um, but a lot of the upswing focuses on the potential power of grassroots movements um, and sort of as, um, you know, movements starting at the local level, um, enacting public change starting at the lowest level all the way up. Um, but something that's 
sort of shifted after, um, I guess, honestly, in the last month after the end of the Trump presidency has been that even across the country, even on campuses like Harvard, there's been this renewed push for bipartisanship, especially in Congress. Um, but at least to me, and it might be because I'm a little cynical, even after, you know, a, such a momentous event like the storming of the Capitol, it, it seems like there's still so little that the parties agree on. I'm, I, I was racking my brain for the entirety of the forum um, that happened just now trying to think of, you know, even one issue where I feel like a large number of Democrats and a large number of Republicans mm. are willing to cooperate at the federal level. Right. So my question to you guys is, do you feel like this bipartisan project, especially at the federal level, is something worth dedicating our time to? Or should we be devoting ourselves to these grassroots to these grassroots movements that target specific issues like, say, gun control or, or the environment? Mm. Great question. Shin, you want to? No, Bob, go, go ahead. Um, so, Ajay, uh, great question. Um, uh, a couple of things to keep in mind. We are looking at this problem in America, mm -hmm. not, as a, not in terms of the last six months of the, first, of the next six months. Mm -hmm. These trends were underway long before Trump was ever heard of, certainly long before he entered the White House, and they will be with us long after he leaves the White House. I do not mean that he is irrelevant. Of course he's relevant. He's done enormous damage to our democracy, but we'd, get, we'd be wrong if we focused very, very much on the short run. We're trying to focus on the long run. That's the first thing to say. Secondly, and we said this, but we didn't emphasize it enough, national politicians, and especially national politicians, were a lagging variable. The real way to what led that, that progressive era was young people and people at the grassroots working across party lines. Now you're posing that as if it's an alternative. We can, we can have, young people can work together at the national level in parentheses, or we can have uh, decentralized. But, and I, I'm not trying to say what, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. Well, in a way I am trying to tell you what to do. It's, de, it's decentralized, um, bipartisanship, not just for bipartisanship, but you know, if you're sitting in Toledo and you got a real problem there, how are we going to fix the problem in Toledo? Or, you know, or St. John's. I don't, I'm afraid I don't know St. John's, Florida, but that's, and people of goodwill, especially young people of goodwill, it, it may seem like you're miles away from fixing the national problem, but what, what we're saying is that's how the national problem got fixed the last time. Is this making sense? You see what I'm trying to say? Yes, it's making sense. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, Thank and just, keep in, Go ahead, Jim. just Go ahead. keep in mind that so those big national programs that the Progressive Era is famous for came on the tail end of 20 to 30 years of the Jane Addamses working on the ground. So we can't just skip that piece. We got to do the work on the ground. Thanks, Ajay. Um, Kathleen from the K School. Kathleen, your question. We still have Kathleen. Well, while she's trying to, while while we're trying to find Kathleen or the next question, is there any is there anything that you wanted to say, Shaylin or Bob, in response to the conversation we had, or more? Oh, there she is. Oh, and she <laughs> she was there for a hot second, and then she disappeared. No, no, it's it's not it's not me. It's my husband, and I'm going to put him on now. <laughs> <We're sharing laughs> okay, okay. Kathleen's husband. Hey, welcome. That's John Rich, actually. Hi, everybody. John, Jason, your question. Yeah, good question. How does climate change uh, work into all the dynamics that are being discussed tonight? So how does climate change um, fit into the dynamics that yeah, are being discussed it's tonight? Excellent question. Chaylin, I mean, both of us could answer it, but why did you go? I mean, I mean, the short answer is that climate change is the ultimate we issue, right? right. I mean, that's yeah. the short answer. There is not a yeah. single person who has the luxury of saying that's that doesn't apply to me. So you guys all work on that and I, you know, I'm gonna focus on something else. I don't know that we've all come to that realization quite, but that's a that's a statement of fact. And so I think that that's one thing, but I also think the same principle that Bob was just pointing out here applies, which is that I think some of the most innovative solutions to climate change are actually happening in what 
the progressive Louis Brandeis called the laboratories of democracy on the municipal levels, on the state levels, experimenting with different ways of dealing with things at a small scale, and then looking at how we can um, um, push those up to a larger scale. So again, sometimes we think, oh, this is such a huge issue, like the whole world's gonna have to cooperate to solve climate change. Well, I think ultimately that probably is true, but we're gonna be looking for the ideas and the innovations from that grassroots level, the same as any other problem that we're gonna have to solve. Yeah. Uh, yesterday in the Times, uh, Emily Badger had a, a really succinct and thorough article that she, she compete, uh, completed about um, uh, just a, a lot of people from, from um, diverse directions having really, um, really great ideas um, mm -hmm. that, that focus on, on uh, ultimately, you know, social cohesion and, and uh, but they come from um, environmental corrections, uh, you know, which, which employ a lot of social, <laughs> sure. social involvement. It was so, really uh, amazing article. I, well, no, go no, ahead, I, Bob, and there were, I was just gonna give a pat on the back to Emily Badger, who's to my mind, one of the very best social science reporters in America, maybe the best social science reporter. Yeah. And she is right. By the way, look at the, look at the virus. The virus is itself an I, we, I issue, an I, or we issue. If I'm an I person, I don't care whether you get the virus, I'm not gonna wear my mask. But, if it's a, but the only way we're gonna solve the, the virus issue is if we think about what our, our you know, germs spilling out mm -hmm. are other people. We're not gonna solve the, there's so many crucial today issues that we have to have a we perspective on. I mean, just technically, we have to have a we perspective, we're not gonna get there. And, and climate change is one, and the, and the coronavirus is another. Sorry, Jonathan, I was- getting... Thank you for a question. I'm only rushing because one, we're running out of time. And two, we have Arjun from Harvard College who's standing by with his question. Hi, thank you so much for your time. Um, this forum has been really eye-opening on a lot of different issues. Um, my question is kind of in regards to how this we mentality fits into more forward-looking racial inclusivity. Uh, as, you know, as we look at history, we see that oftentimes there's one group that we as Americans tend to oppress, then we learn that that oppression is unjustifiable, and then we go on to working on the road to, to repair all of the damage that was done. But how can we kind of work towards building a we mentality that not just deals with addressing some of the underlying issues that remain from the past, largely in revolves to the oppression of African Americans, but also make sure that this mentality uh, can facilitate more inclusion looking forward for, for the groups that have yet to kind of come into the general spotlight of American thought? Well, Great question. Either it is a very good question. Either of us can, can address that. I mean, you want, I'm happy to, but you go, go ahead, ahead, Bob. Well, it involves, among other things, immigration. Um, and, and maybe it involves other things too, but especially immigration. And we're at the, immigration, by the way, has, had, has a, a kind of a life cycle, sort of analogous, I'm not gonna go through the whole data thing here, an, analogous to this. That is to say, um, it's not an accident that the um, gates against immigration were opened most recently in 1964 at the very peak of this, because it was in a we period that we be, that we were willing to be and 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 be more open. And it's not an accident that during the I period we've gotten more and more hostile to immigrants. That is, people my age, old folks have, uh, not me actually, but people, but old folks have, <laughs> but young folks haven't, and, th and therefore I actually th I'm actually let me I have three grandchildren. Um, my daughter married a guy from Costa Rica. I have three Tico grandchildren. They don't look anything like me. I mean, I'm pink and they look, and they're brown. <laughs> um, but, uh, and therefore I see the world as much through, that, that's my future, right? They're my grandchildren. I see the future through their eyes. And actually I'm pretty optimistic. White folks like me have from the beginning, you know, we, we, we my, my folks actually arrived here in 1640. And I just want to tell you the world's seen from the perspective of my, the Putnams. The Putnams go back to 1640. And every 30 or 40 years, a bunch of other folks come in. First, it was the Dutch. Now, let me tell you, the Dutch are hard to deal with. 
And we had a long time in which we had fights between us and the Dutch. And then gradually we got it together and our kids began to marry and, you know, and then we forgot. And then the Germans, and let me tell you, the Germans are really, really hard to deal with, right? And they wanted to speak only German. They only wanted to speak German, whereas we all know the natural language. My folks know that English is the only natural language. The Germans insisted for decades to speak only German. But gradually we, got, we assimilated them. And then we even developed a label for Anglo-Saxon, which meant us and the Dutch and the Germans. That was fine. And then the Irish began to arrive. And I'm telling you, Irish are, you don't know, Irish. I mean, they're difficult, but gradually, and then the Italians and so on. So I want you to see the world as um, white guys are the victim of this whole thing. The only, I mean, you understand, I'm joking when I, I hope you understand I'm joking. When I'm joking. <laughs> yes. The main thing I'm trying to say is America has a history of, the first reaction is the aller allergic reaction, but then actually more than any other country in the world, I'm actually a, a real patriot here, more than any other, I'm a patriot on behalf of my grandchildren. I am utterly confident, RJ, that my grandchildren are gonna be completely, we're gonna be seen as completely normal Americans because we've done that all the time in the past. Does that make sense, RJ? Yes, no, definitely. Shailen? You know, and I would just add that we do, though, have this habit of like centering a white middle class ideal as like the we into which everyone needs to be brought. And I think right now, again, we're at a moment where we're being asked to challenge those primary conceptions. And I think that sometimes uh, I, I think that there needs to be more looking to communities of color to help us as a nation develop sort of a new North Star, if that makes sense. And I think that, you know, when you look back to the progressive era, we didn't get to say a whole lot about this, but there was a real moral awakening that really was the leading variable of this, where, where people were really working down to, the, down to the foundations of what this nation should be about. Now, granted, they didn't get down far enough, and that's our work for today. But I think that, you know, um, it's not just that we have a we that's here and we need to widen it to include other people. I think sometimes we need to think about a, a new definition of what it means to be American. We need to have that conversation. And I think that people of color need to lead it. Thank you both so much for your answers. Thanks, Arjun. And actually, Shailen, that gets to what I was talking about in terms of the, the, the demonstrations that exploded around the country after the killing of George Floyd, where it really did feel like in those demonstrations, the nation in the streets was asking the question, who are we? How yeah. does this happen in, in our country? Right. Um, and so that's what made me think when you gave that pivot definition earlier, that's exactly what I was thinking about. Arjun, thank you very much for your question. We have Hannah from Harvard College who is there and it really is Hannah. Okay, no person off to the side is <laughs> sneaking in. Your question. Hello, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's been such a fascinating discussion. Um, so my question is in regards to a more current case study. Um, so obviously from impeachment to incitement to insurrection to impeachment again, Donald Trump's presidency was a historic one for sure um, and one that is marked by this idea of I. So in this new era with President Biden calling for unity and you guys noting the importance of grassroots organizers in this shift to a we period, um, I'm curious, how do you think the Republican Party will move going forward? Do you think that we'll see kind of more Trump-esque political figures like Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley? Or do you think we'll see a shift to kind of more moderate peacemakers um, like Sass or Romney that are working towards bipartisan solutions? Well, um, I'm, done, I'm tempted. Hannah, that's a great question. Yeah. And of course, it's the it's a question that's on, you know, I, I'm not only a, an academic, I'm also a citizen. And so I'm, I, that's on my mind every day. But I'm tempted to deduct the question by saying, look, I deal in decades and centuries. I don't deal in weeks and months. So it's hard for me to know what's, I don't have any crystal ball. Um, I do think this is related to something I just said. Um, I don't think it's determined which of those spirits of the Republican Party uh, will, will come. It, it depends on the agency of leaders and, and Republicans themselves. 
or ordinary grassroots Republicans. There are lots. Look, there, we gotta be, I'm a Democrat. But there are lots of ordinary Republicans who voted for Donald Trump who are not Trump. They voted for Trump maybe despite he was Trump, but because they believed in a certain set of programs. And I think it's people like that who are going to, and who are going to, they have, they're, they have to look in their soul at this point of, as to whether they do care more for the country and our country and our national future or not. It's not going to be the. I mean, remember, I'm we're we're thinking in decades and centuries. We're not talking. We're not thinking right now. But you'll be get to the decades and centuries by what you do right now. That's certainly true. Mm -hmm. And. Um, uh, Shane and I've gone back. I've spent a lot of time going back and forth, and I don't. We're, we're not going to try to bring that whole argument out here about whether the violence. The both of us think there's going to be a lot of violence. I mean, a lot of, of white terrorism, uh, white nationalist terrorism going forward. The question is: Is it going to be, you know, one percent of the population, or is it going to draw on support from twenty-five percent or thirty percent of the population? Yeah. I, I have thought until recently. That, that that it was going to be very painful to get through terrorism, it always is, but that we were going to be dealing with a 1% problem rather than a 24% problem or 25% problem. Uh, I have to say in the last week or two, I become to one to worry about that. I, I, Shailene, you want to, I know, and, I, you, and you have maybe a slightly different view than me, Shailene. So you Go ahead, to, Shailene. So, so part of why Bob and I differ in our views is that he lives in a zip code where 75, 80% of people voted for Biden, and I live in a zip code where 75% of people voted for Trump. So my neighbors look very different than Bob's neighbors. And so I, you know, the people who make up the Republican Party are my neighbors. So I really am looking to them as a bellwether. I'm looking less to Romney as a bellwether and more to my neighbors as to whether or not they are more persuaded by Romney's worldview or Trump's. And I, I like Bob, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't predict that. But I do think that um, the more it can become, it can be, the more people have faith in Biden's visions of unity and, and don't, and stop sort of saying that that's a cover for the Democrats sort of taking over, you know, like the more that we can, the, the, the Democratic Party can demonstrate that that call for unity is real and not just sort of a smokescreen for, for doing, you know, what they want to do with the country, the more I think there's going to be hope for Republicans to turn in that better direction. But I don't know. I think there's a lot of leaders in the Republican Party who could pull it in that way, but, but will they? That's, that boils down again to citizen agency. Hannah, thank you very much for your question. Um, we, okay, we've got one minute. <clears throat> so um, in the one minute that we have left, final thoughts, Bob, you go first. Well, I am basically optimistic, actually. I mean, I'm bas basically optimistic by nature, I think, uh, Jonathan. Uh, in the case of race and, and, and ethnicity, immigration and so on, it's true we've done a lot of awful things as a country. But it's not just that the white we has has um, come to terms with the, the you know the Italians or the Irish or whatever the the, the my, my grandchildren the Costa Ricans we've historically America has changed its we mm -hmm. the we that America has today is not the we that America that is it's just not that what we think of as American today isn't the same as we thought in 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 1900 and so I'm pretty optimistic. Not that America is without flaws, but that we have it within ourselves, within our own history, to come to terms with big, big changes. Yeah. Hey, Lynn, your final thoughts. Yeah, and I would just say, you know, this is, you know, this is the Institute of Politics, so this is, you know, a lot of undergraduates that are probably listening in, and I would just say, you've lived only during the downturn, and so have I. You know, I'm a, a Gen Xer, right, who's only known more more and more inequality, more and more polarization, more and more social dislocation, more and more narcissism. But the thing that I think is so important about the upswing is that it reminds us what Bob knows from lived experience, which is that within living memory, all of those negative trends were moving in the opposite direction. And so there is a sense that like all is lost and we're just, we're just sliding down this terrible road, but it hasn't always been that way. There was a time in living memory when America was getting more and more equal, more and more inclusive, more and more um, 
more and more politically cooperative, more and more together, more and more sense of we, more and more altruistic. We can make that happen again. We're going to have to be patient because that upswing, again, there was a pivot and then a 60 to 70 year climb to get to that peak. We're going to have to be patient. But I just would say to young people who only know the downturn, we can do it. It's been done before. Just because we haven't lived it doesn't mean that it wasn't there in our history. We need to reconnect with that optimism and get to work. And I will um, just give my brief final thought. And that is, I think the pivot that Shaylin talked about, I think that pivot has, has begun. Um, and I think that the Parkland generation, which I've been writing about, they give me so much hope, their response to what happened to them. And then what happened across the, across the country after the killing of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, that the young people who, as Shaylin said, have only known the sort of the downswing, they took it upon themselves to do, to do something better, to change the direction, or in Shaylin's word, to pivot. And so with that, I wanna thank Shaylin Romney, Shaylin Romney Garrett, Professor Robert Putnam, Thank you very, very much for doing this and for your book, The Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again. Thank you both very much. Congratulations on the book. Thanks very much. Thank Dr. you, Jonathan. And thanks to all the listeners because the people listening to this are the people who are gonna save America. That's our message. Yeah. Good night. Thank you.